Hey everyone, welcome to Tales in Text and I am your host Nisha. Welcome to another episode in the Reading the Mahabharata series. And in today's video, we are going to be discussing Yayati, Devyani and the art of consent and creating boundaries for ourselves. So grab something to eat, grab something to drink. This is going to be a long video. And uh, join me as we discuss the material in the critical edition of the Mahabharata pertaining to the story of Devyani. The protagonist of our video today is going to be Devyani and her children. And we're going to be exploring why the story of Yayati is so groundbreaking given the timeline of the Mahabharata. So let's dive right in. The story of King Yayati is uh, a very beautifully fleshed out uh, part of the Mahabharata. It doesn't form the core story of the Mahabharata. It doesn't feature anywhere close to where the Pandavas and the Kauravas have the Kurukshetra war. So it doesn't come anywhere close to the crux of the Mahabharata. Yet it is such a pivotal story in the larger uh, grand scheme of things within the epic and the way the story of Yayati, Devyani and Sharmishta are fleshed out in the Mahabharata points to uh, at least according to me evidence that possibly there was a chieftain if not a king who was similar to Yayati or maybe their name was Yayati and perhaps their life story was something similar. Now the story of King Yayati and his wives uh, and in fact his life story is something that's very fascinating uh, and just to give you a brief to set the stage I'm going to be giving you some information so you can kind of make sense of uh, what place in the Mahabharata we are in and what is the foundation on which our discussion is going to take place. So King Yayati is King Nahusha's son. Uh, King Nahusha and King Yayati are essentially the ancestors of the Pandavas and the Kauravas, that is the Kuru dynasty. They come significantly early in the timeline of uh, Hindu kings in the mythological evolution of Hinduism. We see King Yayati grow up as a youth who is spoiled and who's essentially been given all the luxuries of life. Of course, it doesn't mean that he is a bad person or a bad king. He definitely has the markings of a king who is um, who is capable and who cares about his uh, his his subjects and who cares about his family. So he, you definitely do get a sense of Yayati as someone who is uh, who is a good person yet he is also spoiled and because of being so uh, well being treated as the uh, the light of his parents eyes the apple of their eyes he's given everything and therefore he doesn't ever grow up getting used to the word no he doesn't ever grow up being denied anything now when he grows up he goes out on a hunt he comes across a woman in a well who ends up becoming his wife that is Devyani who happens to be uh, Maharishi Ushanas or Shukracharya's daughter. Shukracharya is considered to be the preceptor of the demons or the Asuras. Now before we go ahead I do want to make it very uh, clear that in Hinduism the definition of Asura doesn't technically translate to demon because not every Asura qualifies to be this mythical monster who falls into the realm of demons and asura according to me according to my research and according to my understanding is a person who follows conventions and cultures that are outside the aryan civilization and when we say aryan we are talking about um, the established most accepted sort of vedic uh, culture that is being followed that is espoused by the priests and by the kings of the time that is essentially what falls within the Aryan culture now for example if you take in the Ramayana for example we are just going to go a little outside the Mahabharata now we would see that King Rama and his family and his community fall within the Vedic traditions fall within the Aryan traditions and anyone outside of that tradition is considered to be um, someone who should be looked at warily who should be treated with more caution and who should be exterminated if you get the chance because after all they are they are different from us and anyone who's different must not be 
a good person so that's the kind of ideology that is that is there if you see throughout the hindu epics uh, where anyone who doesn't follow these vedic traditions who isn't within this vedic system of culture is considered to be demon like because they are someone different with their own unique set of practices and and lifestyles and belief systems so i want to establish that asuras necessarily don't mean demons so when you read about asuras in any hindu mythology or hindu um, epic or or philosophical text let your mind not immediately jump to um, the tag of demons because that's not what they are so now uh sage shukracharya or also called sage ushanas is the preceptor of the d of the asuras and uh, essentially he teaches them the uh, art of mantras different mantras for uh, gaining uh, spiritual power for gaining uh, uh you know weapons because certain weapons for example like the brahmastra can only be got through through mantra so essentially these are spells that are put on specific objects thereby enchanting that object with the power of that spell making that object deadly so there are many different kinds of things uh, uh, that uh, shukracharya would teach and train the asuras on and devyani was his daughter now yayati meets devyani and uh, they get married and uh, one thing leads to another and uh, sharmishtha becomes devyani's slave and how she becomes the slave of devyani is that once devyani and sharmishtha would have gone to um, sport around in the local pond and sharmishtha takes a, a very fancy looking sari and she wears it devyani is incensed because that is a gift that she had received from somebody else and she tells sharmishtha hey this is mine how can you wear this without my permission and sharmishtha says how can a lowly dependent like you afford a sari like this because sharmishtha's father is the king of the asuras called king vrishaparva and so to sharmishtha devyani and her father sage shukracharya are dependents because they depend on the generosity and the patronage of her father king vrishaparva so she feels uh, you know she 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 can she can't believe that someone who is a poor lowly brahmana sage's daughter can afford something so fancy and she feels that devyani is lying to her devyani is in sense she is ashamed she is embarrassed she is hurt and she cannot believe what she is what she is hearing because the truth is monetarily shukracharya may not be as rich as vrishaparva but he is vrishaparva's teacher making him essentially higher in level uh, to sharmishtha's father and by extension devyani higher in social status compared to sharmishtha and so she is incensed and they have a fight and while they're having a sort of a tug of war with the sari um devyani slips and falls into the well which is where yayati finds her later and because of this sharmishtha is sorry devyani is never able to forgive sharmishtha and she uh, demands from vrishaparva that uh, if her if his daughter sharmishtha follows her as a slave to her mar marital home then she will be then she and her father will continue to give their patronage to vrishaparva and the asura dynasty the asura clan Uh, otherwise shukracharya would have uh, decided to leave vrishaparva's kingdom because he is angry at the slight that his daughter has faced ultimately uh, vrishaparva agrees sharmishtha agrees and sharmishtha comes into the home of devyani and yayati as devyani's slave and it is here that yayati starts an extramarital affair with sharmishtha now technically speaking uh, it is believed that sharmishtha and yayati had a gandharva marriage so a gandharva marriage is one of the one of the different kinds of marriages that you have in hinduism of course today's reality we don't have any such distinction there's just one kind of marriage if you look at traditional hindu weddings and that is uh, a vedic wedding where you have all these chants and scriptures being read but in the ancient times there were different types of marriages so for example marriage by abduction marriage through maya or illusion marriage through this this vedic method and then gandharva marriage and of course many more now a gandharva marriage is essentially where the bride and the groom will look upon mother earth uh, nature the sun and the moon the stars and 
the heavenly objects as witnesses to their union and when i say union it means sexual union and it is believed that the sexual union is enough to uh, confirm their status as a married couple so now it is believed that Sharmishna and Yayati had indeed had a Gandharva marriage. Now the legality of which of course if you consider the, the legality of it in terms of uh, Vedic marriage versus Gandharva marriage. Um, ultimately given the status that it, was, it happened in ancient India although they were almost equal ultimately Devyani's uh, status as a wife was more legitimate compared to Sharmishta's status as Yayati's wife. Now many years pass and Yayati is an old man now and he decides that you know what I have not had my fill of material things I want to experience pleasure even for a longer period of time and I don't want to grow old I want to and, and that's the one thing about Yayati is that he is someone who's addicted to pleasure and especially carnal pleasure pleasure of the flesh and I'm not just talking about uh, pleasures of the flesh in terms of sex and intimacy I'm talking about pleasures of the flesh in terms of eating hunting um, anything that is extravagant opulent in the lap of luxury anything material that is something he really enjoys and years ago during at the time of his birth a sage would have predicted that no matter what happens king nahusha's children will never be happy no matter what they get and that is a theme that you see throughout his life that yayati has everything he has a flourishing kingdom he's really rich he has two wives he has a bunch of sons and yet he is unhappy because his uh, desire for physical pleasure is never fulfilled and so now he wants uh, to continue to stay young so that he can continue to experience this joy this pleasure he gets to find out that there is a solution there's a workaround to cheat death and that is basically by giving up your old age to someone who's younger and taking on their youth that way you get the number of years that they have remaining and they will grow old and die in your place that way the books of uh, yama that is the, the books of death will continue to remain balanced because the life that he was the, the god of death was supposed to receive will be given to him in due time and this is where things start to get really interesting. So Yayati thinks that because he's the dad, uh, due to filial piety being such an important thing in not just Indian, but entire Asian uh, history, that is something that is ingrained in Asia, in Asian culture as a whole filial piety, wherein children do everything that the parents ask them to. They don't, they, and they do it unquestioningly uh, with complete faith and that is a theme that you see even in ancient Indian literature, in ancient Indian uh, epics. And so he expects that this shouldn't be any problem. I can just ask my sons and at least one of them will agree. And he's sure that every son he asks will say yes. And what happens is that Devyani's sons, all of them just give an outright no. Whereas one of Sharmishtha's sons, Puru, says yes. And so he exchanges his old age for Puru's youth and he experiences a lot of pleasure for many, many years. And ultimately when Puru is just about to die, when he is very old, Yayati feels bad for his son and thinks that, okay, I've enjoyed his youth. So might as well just make the switch, make the transfer. And he gives up his youth to Puru once again and takes back his old age and he instates Puru as king and he dies. Now this is where our um, video discussion will start. This, this particular setting of his marriage, his extramarital affair, the asking for somebody's youth and what we can discuss about, uh, about, you know, about female empowerment, about the act of consent and about drawing boundaries. So Yayati's story is just so rich with parables and so rich with insight that, you know, even just these three just scratch the surface. There's so much more that we can look into. But before we go ahead with this, I do want to go back to the whole Asura explanation that I did so that I can just kind of tie it up in a neat little bow. Now, because Yayati instates Puru as the king, anyone who comes after him, that is Puru's descendants, his sons, his grandsons and so on, inherit the kingdom. And the Kuru lineage, the Kuru dynasty, which includes the Pandavas and the Kauravas and King Jaya, who is actually listening to the Mahabharata, they are all in essence related to King Puru and King Puru is King Vrishaparva, the Asura's grandson. So technically speaking in the Mahabharata, all the people that we actually uh, interact with, 
the major players in the Mahabharata are all part Asura because they all hail from Puru whose mother is Sharmishta who was an Asura woman herself. So this should kind of give you a sense of just how pigeonholing certain communities as good versus bad as um, angels versus demons is something that just cannot be done especially when it comes to Hindu literature, Hindu mythology because there's just so much more to the eye than uh, so much more to the issue than what the eye can see and because now they are part Asuras we can't of course say and negate their experiences by saying that hey they are evil people that's why they are barbaric that's why the Kurukshetra war happened um, ultimately you see so many of them display this beautiful level of humanity empathy and kindness and love that is uh, that other, that people would otherwise you know if you, if you kind of start pigeonholing them as asuras and non asuras they would believe that asuras are not capable of right i do accept that uh, in india in ancient india especially you know it was the father's lineage that mattered most so therefore he was considered human because you know, yati was human but let's just take it and on a practical level, both the mom and the dad do have to contribute their DNA to have this baby and so the Sura DNA is still there. Okay, now coming back to Yayati, Devyani, Sharmishta and the act of consent and the art of drawing boundaries. Now what I want to discuss about in this video is basically uh, how Devyani in particular, because she is the protagonist, she is the star of our video today. Uh, how Devyani in particular became a sort of proto-feminist for um, in, in Hindu literature, in Hindu mythology. Uh, and the reason I call her proto-feminist is because a lot of decisions that she took were really, uh, you know, empowering for women. They helped, they were a step further in the emancipation of women at a time where male dominion was so strong that a woman could not step even a toe outside the line and the repercussions for even stepping a toe outside the line were catastrophic and in that time Devyani stood up head, held her head high and said you know what I'm not gonna put up with this bullshit I want you to listen to me and respect my feelings and I think that's a beautiful beautiful uh, ex, you know character trait because you don't see a lot of women who openly um, fight against the patriarchy and the these patriarchal values of male dominion over women of um, male sexual agency versus holding tight and repressing women sexually of not considering the consent of women not considering or caring for the feelings of women by doing whatever they as men wanted and Devyani stood up against all of this and this is a trait that she passed on to her children as well so um, if you have the critical edition just do grab the book so that we can go right in and start discussing about some of the passages that really stand out and which really explore this trait that Devyani possesses we start off at page 220 uh, this is a stage where Yayati has already met Devyani this is the pre-marriage uh, era and we see in page 220 Devyani's knowledge of what was considered right versus what was considered wrong. Devyani's understanding of Vedic traditions especially when it comes to uh, uh, you know marriage and relationships between uh, a man and a woman and how she uses this knowledge because after all she is Shukracharya's daughter she is smart and you know that's one of the things that I find really frustrating is that Devyani's pigeonholed as someone who is only beautiful that she has she's beauty and no brains she's beauty and she's she's pettiness but not magnanimous or not kind and that kind of uh, unidimensional character sketch of Devyani is does such a great disservice to her. Right off the bat in page 220 you see how Devyani convinces Yayati to marry her. Um, Yayati agree, decides to help Devyani outside out of the well because she's fallen inside the well after her fight with Sharmishta right and so Yayati wants to help her and when Devyani is cli climbing out of the well she gives her right hand to Yayati and Yayati holds her right hand with his right hand and he pulls her up. That's when she says when Yayati tries to remove his hand from hers and she says you know you held my hand now you've taken my hand in marriage you can't let me go. She falls in love with him so she says you know you have to marry me there is 
this is what the shastra says she says oh fortunate one please be my friend and my husband yayati replied oh beautiful one i am not worthy of you you are the daughter of ushanas oh devayani your fa your father cannot marry you to a king okay this is basically because you know um, in hinduism essentially it was believed that uh, only people of this at the same level caste wise can get married to each other so um and again when it comes to marriage it was only the male who had to be of the higher lineage and not the woman who could get married to someone of the lower lineage so for example a brahmana man could marry a kshatriya woman but a brahmana woman could not marry a kshatriya man essentially because the woman was expected to take on the lineage of her husband and so by giving up her higher status she would go on to a lower status and her children would have to uh, contend with growing up in a caste that was of a lower cast that was the ideology behind it so and this is what yayati is afraid of because he's like i i don't think your father who is a brahmana sage would like the fact that you a brahmana woman would marry a kshatriya man like me so devayani says brahmanas have always been united with kshatriyas and kshatriyas have always been united with brahmanas you are a rishi and the son of a rishi o son of nahusha therefore marry me and i think this is in reference to king nausha being very pious and he would always spend his time with sages and he would learn a lot of uh, he would study uh, dharma and philosophy a lot so uh, although there's no information given here in terms of uh, in terms of the notes as to why she uses this statement um, my understanding is because of this uh, if there are any changes to this i will definitely update it in the description box later so please do read my description box the notes that i've given over there because sometimes i update certain notes that i've changed that i've said in the video which i may need to modify or i may need to add to i usually add them in the description box so do keep an eye out for that and then the the conversation goes on where both of them are going back and forth yayati saying i can't marry you devyani saying you have to marry me and ultimately devyani convinces him that you know what you can marry me now this video is also is about consent so you might be wondering why i'm talking about this wherein devyani essentially seems like she's forcing herself on yayati without considering his consent but you need to remember one thing in the previous section where you know in the previous chapter uh, you see when when uh, yayati meets devyani he is infatuated with her he thinks she is one of the most beautiful women he's seen on the earth he thinks she is a goddess and he uh, feels desire for her but when he hears that she is a brahmana's daughter that's when he backs away because he's worried about uh, any possible negative consequences such as curses that uh, sage shukracharya might give him or might send to him for having the audacity of loving his daughter but technically speaking he this is something that he would totally be okay with because he is infatuated with devyani he thinks she is like i said the most beautiful woman in the world so devyani all she did was kind of remove these um, doubts and fears that yayati had about being cursed or about not being welcomed into the family by her father or about possibly breaking any uh, major rules according to the uh, according to the religion and the religious traditions of the time so ultimately what happens is shukracharya comes to know and he says you know you have been chosen by my beloved daughter as her husband and so i give her to you accept her as your queen so he gives uh, permission to yayati and yayati is is you know is really excited he's really happy and then he requests shukracharya for a boon let no great sin descend on me as a consequence of my begetting offspring of mixed caste and shukracharya says i free you from this non adherence to dharma you will receive your desired boon no sin will befall you as a result of this marriage and then he says uh, maintain the slender wasted devyani as your wife in accordance with dharma with her may you find incomparable happiness and so he says chukracharya says don't worry your union has been blessed by me so no one's going to mess with you nothing bad's going to happen to you or your lineage just be happy with her treat her with respect treat my daughter with respect and kindness love her always and everything will be as good as awesome as it's meant to be so as long as you take care of her and don't transgress your vows and in the end he also says always respect this ma maiden sharmishtha vrishaparva's daughter and you must never call her to your bed 
and that is one of the rules that shukracharya places that the only way you and your family will be safe you and your lineage lineage will be safe is if you promise me that you will never call sharmishta to your bed and yayati agrees uh, and uh, he happily returns to his city so we see in this instance uh, devyani's knowledge of dharma and her uh, decision to choose her own husband is something is sort of like is 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 in a way representative of building boundaries because a lot of times in the past including even a lot of times today uh, arranged marriages for example are the great example of this is that women are often not given the agency to choose their own partners to choose their own or choose their own spouses they the decision is given to the elders of the family it could be the parents or uncles or even someone much older maybe a community leader and so devyani go going ahead and saying you know what i don't care what society says i have fallen in love with you and i will marry you itself is is a way of building boundaries is a way of protecting herself is a way of championing her um, agency her desires and giving her desires priority as opposed to just covering against societal rules and uh, being okay with whoever her father chooses to you know give her as a wife to so this is a great way of uh, looking at devyani's strength of character of going against a patriarchal tradition of where the older family members choose a spouse for the girl let's fast forward to the time where um, we know that yayati is obviously sleeping with sharmishta and uh, <clears throat> Devyani finds out. In page two hundred and twenty-four, we see in the second half of the page, Devyani understands that uh, Sharmishta and Yayati are sleeping together, and Sharmishta's children are actually Yayati's children. And she says, she tells Sharmishta, "You are owned by me. How have you dared to do that which brings displeasure to me?" Uh, because sharmishta was owned by devyani as a slave because of what happened in her girlhood um again you know we see a lot of classism and casteism happening over here and she says how dare you do something to defy me that was my one rule that you cannot bed my husband even my father had uh, ordered my husband to not bed you and yet both of you have transgressed this this particular rule this particular request and most importantly you have transgressed these marital uh sacred vows that we had made to each other that it would only be the two of us how dare you do this and then sharmishta says oh beautiful one you chose the king as your husband so did i according to dharma a friend's husband is one's own husband okay <laughs> as well as stop here for a minute and say that uh this is just downright weird at least current day hindus do not believe that at least i don't know if anyone who does um one thing i do want to say is that a lot of these rules if you if you thought you see in these epics that you see in philosophical texts a lot of these conventions were actually made for the benefit of men it was not made for the benefit of women it was not made by women for women it was made by men for men now saying that you know a friend's husband is like one's own husband doesn't really benefit the woman it's not like the woman will be allowed to sleep around with any man who she who her friends are married to rather it so it gives the friend's husband leeway to demand sexual services from another woman uh, on the pretext that it is dharma for a woman to sleep with her friend's husband so all of these rules were made to satisfy masculine male dominion and male sexual desire and it was in no way related to giving women the agency to uh, satisfy their sexual urges So, so Sharmishta uses this as an excuse to say that you know what it is dharma. So you, you are my friend. He is your husband, and so by extension, he is my husband. And so I slept with him. So what's wrong? Well, what's wrong in that? And Devyani is pissed off, and rightly so. And this is something really beautiful because in this section we see her righteous anger. Right? We see her getting angry. We see her demanding Yayati to apologize. We see her demanding him to course correct, and we see her demanding Sharmishta to stay the hell away from her family. 
and this is something that's very rare because if you look at at any other uh, you know hindu uh, related epic or story or mythology or whatever it is even history for that matter we see most women you know sort of gagged down by societal pressure uh, it is anticipated and expected behavior to to see the husband gallivanting around with absolutely anyone he fancies while the woman is supposed to quietly stay inside the home inside the kitchen not making a peep and it is expected for women to put up with whatever slights the husband may throw at her even if it kills her inside even if it is like the worst sort of insult that she could be receiving because that's what a good woman does and devyani is like screw this i don't care what a good woman is supposed to do because this is not what i signed up for this is not what the, this is not the kind of marriage i wanted i wanted you to be you know uh, loyal to me not cheat on me with my so called friend and you see that it's a very hugely hugely empowering feminist move it is a, one of the very few instances in the uh, mahabharata where you see a woman openly defying a patriarchal misogynistic tradition and saying i want you to respect me and i want you to consider what how this has impacted me instead of solely making it about you so that's really beautiful and so devyani says oh king you have caused me displeasure i will not live here any longer and having said this the dusky one quickly ro uh, arose with tears in her eyes in a miserable state she went to her father kavya kavya is again another name for ushanas or shukracharya here uh, just in this in this one very tiny portion we also see a kind of uh, uh, sort of an opposite force working wherein she is moving from her husband's house back to her father's house now some of you might say that okay you're say that you know, i'm saying that she's uh, taking a step forward towards you know emancipating women empowering women so why is she going back to her father's house why couldn't she go and live alone separately again that was not something that was done at that time a single woman without a guardian would have been easy prey <clears throat> for a lot of uh, bad people so for her the better uh, choice was to go to her father's house where she was always treated like a princess where she was treated with love and respect as opposed to staying in her husband's house where she was this second hand uh, you know wife who her husband clearly didn't care about uh, and uh, so the, so this was a much better option for her so even leaving her husband's house was a huge huge step for her because even today even today in many many places uh, and this is again mostly we see in villages or you know in in rural areas or in in communities even in the urban area in communities which are still very conservative a married woman going back to her parents house after having a fight with her husband or his family uh is often not uh, you know taken in with open arms of course things are changing things we are seeing more uh, parents of women becoming uh, open to the idea of their daughters getting a divorce or coming back to their house because their marriage is not working out and things like that but still there are many instances where uh, a woman is expected to just put up with whatever experiences she is experiencing in her husband's house and to just put up with it instead of coming home crying so the fact that in such an ancient time devyani is being shown as you know is taking her own agency and saying i'm not going to live with a cheater uh, and uh, and going back to her father's house is a huge huge move in itself it is shocking it it it, sh it shook cultural values at its foundations we see that uh, yayati is feeling guilty in the next page with 225 he is feeling guilty so he goes uh, he follows her uh, to her father's house and devyani says evil has won over dharma the inferior have ascended and the superior have been brought down i have been overtaken by sharmishta virsha parva's daughter this king yayati has fathered three sons through that wretched woman but i have only got only two sons <laughs> and once again we see here um sort of like a co-wife slash mistress wife jealousy also as well and you know the fact that uh, that you know he went and fathered more sons with uh, sharmishta was once again proof that he preferred spending more time in sharmishta's bed than in devyani's bed he preferred spending more time with sharmishta than with devyani therefore which we show how he is constantly breaking one marital vow after after another shukracharya is really angry and he says oh great king you know dharma well yet you have committed sin for the sake of pleasure therefore invincible old age will soon oppress you 
Shukracharya curses him that old age will oppress you immediately because whatever you've been doing is for the, for the sake of uh, experiencing only physical pleasure. I'm going to take away uh, your bodily capacity to experience pleasure. I think that's like the best punishment for someone like Yayati, right? <laughs> Yayati tries to kind of wheedle his way out of this and then he says, he gives an excuse as to why he slept with Sharmishta in the first place. The daughter of the Lord of the Danavas, Danavas is another word for Asuras or another type of Asuras. The daughter of the Lord of the Danavas begged me to make her season bear fruit. So that means oh, she was fertile at that moment and she was uh, feeling the urge to have a child. So she asked me and therefore it was with, with that thought and no other that I thought that I did what I thought was right. Those who know the Brahman say that a man who is asked by a woman for the fruition of her season must grant her wish. Otherwise, he commits the sin of killing an, an, an embryo. A man who refuses when a desiring woman privately solicits him is called a killer of an embryo by the learned. The more I think about it, it kind of strikes me that this could have, have had dual purposes, that this could be from an earlier time uh, where, you know, there was no such thing as marriage binding a couple together. Therefore, a man and a woman could go to whoever they wanted and therefore a woman who wanted, who was in her fertile season could ask any male to impregnate her. This is something that we even see in animals, right? Uh, female animals, when they are in their season, when they're fertile, they just go to the, they leave their scent or they go to the, the, the uh, uh, nearest male and there's a mating ritual that happens and then the male impreg impreg impregnates her. So this could have been a vestige of, of a very, very ancient tradition that uh, where, which predated marriage. Um, after which, again, uh, as society evolved, this could have been used as an excuse by men in order to gain sexual dominion of women um, especially women who possibly could have been with widows or with virgins or with uh, with women whose uh, husbands were uh, far away for work so this is really interesting i'm going to be doing more research on this and i will get back to you maybe do a follow-up video some other day when i do have enough information but this was a interesting insight that kind of i was thinking about for the purposes of yayati's story this is a bullshit excuse right and shukracharya is just not buying it because i mean obviously shukracharya knows dharma okay he is one of the most revered sages in the universe of the mahabharata and he knows that that you know yayati is just trying to twist dharma for his own sake to avoid punishment he's like you know what this is just i call bullshit okay i call bullshit this is not this is not how dharma works and he says oh son of nausha by committing a falsehood you have become a thief in the eyes of dharma ouch this got a hurt. Being thus cursed by the angry Ushanas, Yayati, son of Nahusha, was instantly deprived of his earlier youth and old age overcame him. And uh, the worst what Yayati could imagine happened to him, he lost the capacity to experience pleasure because now his body was so old that it couldn't experience pleasure to its ultimate form, in its pure form. So then Yayati is upset and he begs uh, uh, Shukracharya uh, you know, I, I have, I'm not satiated, satiated with Devayani's youth yet. Now again, he's using his daughter, Shukraja's daughter as a pawn. You know, like, I, I haven't experienced enough pleasure with your daughter yet. Are you really going to deprive your daughter of, of her, of my company as a youth? You have to give me back my youth. And so Shukracharya knows this and, you know, he's, he's a smart, uh, he's a smart man. He's a smart cookie, as they say. And uh, he says, you know what? Okay, I will allow you to regain your youth and we are moving to page 226 now uh, but he says you will be able to transfer your old age to whoever you wish no evil will befall you from that the son who will give you his youth will become the king he will have a long life and numerous offspring and will attain fame now so you can get back your youth but you need to exchange this youth for your old age with one of your sons and this has to be a willing exchange. I've even written a note over here saying that this reminds me so much of the picture of Dorian Gray, where the in, uh, the internal soul uh, uh, was the the corruption of the internal soul is transferred to the photo, the picture of Dorian Gray, and you can see the external uh, landscape. As you can see, the photo changing and evolving as this corruption, uh, you know, it makes the soul uglier. It makes Dorian's soul uglier. Yayati asking for youth from his sons and giving them old age is sort of like you know uh, Dorian Gray kind of you know remaining eternally beautiful eternally youthful and then we see the painting age and kind of mutate into this 
ugly thing which reflects his internal landscape so now this was the first half of the of the story where we see devyani saying you know or no i am not going to put up with whatever you've been doing to me i want you to treat me with respect i want you to treat me with love and so i'm not going to put up with a man who's going to be who's going to continue to cheat on me and uh, i'm not going to be okay with a friend who said uh, who promised me that she wouldn't destroy my marriage she wouldn't destroy my marital home but that's what's happening and so <clears throat> we see devyani uh, really standing up for herself at a time at an age when this was just not done this was considered unwomanly this was considered uh, you know bad and you know just before we continue i do want to also talk of you know i have this other book uh, yayati a classic tale of lust by v s khandekar and we see in this book in particular uh, this is actually i think this was in marathi and it was translated to english we see over here in this book uh, how devyani is considered to be such a petty and vile woman she's considered to be this antagonist she's considered to be this killjoy who just doesn't allow her husband to have fun she's considered to be this you know bad woman who uh, finds fault with the fact that her husband wants to take another wife she is considered to be this murderer who uh, wants to eliminate all other women so that she can possessively hold on to her husband so this book in particular we see uh, this book vilifying the character of devyani for being so uh, empowered and to to who for for taking a care of her own agency and saying that i'm not going to put up with this which is something really sad but because that is something that you see in so many uh, stories where there are powerful women characters where we see that these women are vilified for being demonesses for being devils for being she wolves uh you know these huntresses uh, you know who are preying on these poor men who are uh, putting up with such a wild wife so we see this kind of criminalization of powerful women who stand up and say that no i want to take care of myself first i want to put myself first in in contrast in this book uh we also see sharmishtha being uh, uh you know being serenaded and celebrated as this uh, little sweet heart who is such a shy uh, you know uh, sweet little thing a poor girl who found herself in these circumstances yeah sure i mean how she became a slave to devyani is something unfortunate but they are pitting her against devyani as she is she is the diamond to devyani's uh garbage you could say or coal she is sweet and kind and accommodating to devyani being petty and jealous and mean she is the perfect wife who puts yayati's every interest every desire every pleasure ahead of her own to devyani's you know putting herself ahead of uh, her husband's you know desire for pleasure sharmishta is the quintessential sacrificial wife uh, the woman who sacrifices herself and her happiness and even her own children so that her husband can continue to gallivant around everywhere to devyani who steps up and says i'm not going to let you uh, do this to me i'm not going to let you take away my pride so we see sharmishta is lauded as being the perfect wife and the perfect woman and the perfect mother here as opposed to devyani who is considered to be a bad woman and that is a thing that you see in many other stories across cultures as well not just in indian culture not just in hinduism you see that in many places for example helen of troy is vilified in greek mythology although technically paris was as responsible for uh, the trojan war and in fact more so uh, but helen is the one who is always considered to be the devil who instigated this war right so we see that happening over and over again once again that shows that even today despite even the critical edition when this was written like i said thousands and thousands of years ago we see devyani exploring her agency and showing that you know what women's needs and wants and beliefs have to be taken uh, you know have to be made a priority and Uh, the juxtaposition of all these future narratives where we see her being shown as someone who's evil is it's really revealing of what we as a culture think of independent women now in the next set we see devyani's sons okay so yayati goes and now he has to ask his sons for 
their youth right in exchange for his old age so he asks his first son by devyani which is yadu and he asks take upon yourself the guilt and the consequent old age i can then enjoy pleasures with your youth when 1000 years have passed i shall return your youth to you and take over the guilt and the consequent old age then yadu his son says o king white hair and beard cheerlessness flabbiness wrinkles on the body ugliness weakness thinness incapacity to work defer, defeated by the youth and forsaking by those who depend on you i do not wish for this old age so yadu says sorry boss uh, old age isn't uh, as glamorous as you make it seem so i'm sorry i don't want to be old i would rather have my youth please ask somebody else so we see yadu drawing boundaries here and so yayati gets pissed off right so he says because you will not give your youth to me your offspring will have no share in the kingdom so yadu is thrown out of the contention for the throne next he goes to his second son by devyani who is turuvasu then he says once again the same thing take up take my old age and give me your youth turuvasu replies oh father i do not desire old age it destroys all desire pleasure strength beauty intelligence and even life and so he says no i don't want old age i'm sorry i want to keep my youth yayati is pissed and he tells turuvasu you were born from my heart but you will not give me give me your youth oh turuvasu therefore your lineage will become extinct oh foolish one you will be a king of king over subjects whose conducts and practices will be impure so then he explains how these impurities will be there and what kind of bad people he turuvasu will become a king of <clears throat> so now both of devyani sons have said no right then we see uh him approaching sharmishta's first son dhruyu and dhruyu says once again you know what uh, one who is old cannot enjoy elephants chariots horses or women speech fails him therefore i do not desire old age and ayati is angry and he curses dhruyu too and he says uh, the most cherished of your desires will not come true you and your lineage will not be kings but will have the title of bhoja now again there's a note saying that the title of bhoja does not make sense uh, when you're looking translating from sanskrit to english perhaps this could be some older word from uh, that word that had become defunct or extinct even at that time but the but bibek de broy has um, hypothesized that this could be an indication of a community uh, prone to addiction especially addiction to food gluttony one of the seven deadly sins in christianity so is this could be uh, about uh, how druyus uh, lineage would possibly fall prey to addiction then yayati so three sons have said no he goes to the fourth son anu and uh, uh, anu says you know what uh, those who are old eat like children drooling and unclean at all times of the day they cannot pour offerings into the sacrificial fire at the right time i do not wish for such an old age and yayati is pissed off once again because this is the fourth son who's saying no to him and then he says since you have described so many faults associated with old age old age will overcome you your offspring will be destroyed as soon as they attain youth you yourself will not be able to perform any sacrifices before the fire so he curses his son as well and finally he goes to his youngest son by sharmishta puru and he asks him puru please accept my old age and give me back your give me your youth and puru says i will o oh king i will do as you have commanded me to do and therefore the transaction is complete puru's youth goes to yayati and yayati's youth comes to puru <clears throat> now this is where we're talking about building boundaries now essentially we're seeing that devyani was someone who has been so empowered and she values her own agency and her feelings over that of a husband who she just cannot trust and you can see that her sons too have been raised with this thought process now again we have to do keep, we have to keep in mind that uh, a lot of times the sons especially were separated from their mothers at a very early age and they were given training separately so they could become future kings so there how close were the interactions between a mother and a son is something up for debate yet i would like to think that because of devyani's inherent um uh, confidence and her quality of being such an empowered person for some, for someone who doesn't take shit lying down her sons too have sort of got this into themselves and they are creating this boundary 
wherein they're telling Yayati, you know what, I value you for, for being my father. I value you for having given me all these uh, riches and these wonderful experiences and this privilege. But I just cannot make this trade. Giving you my youth in exchange for old age is too steep a price to pay. And we see this happening with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, not just Devyani's two sons, but two of Sharmishta's sons as well. And this is where I really want to talk about how important it is for cultures wherein filial piety is so important to not succumb to this parental pressure. You know, not just India, we see across Asia, we see how filial piety, like I discussed earlier, is something considered very serious and not listening to your parents' request is considered akin to sin. And in fact, uh, Puru is also considered to be a greater human being and a person worthy of getting the crown. And that's why Yayati instates him as the ruler, because he's willing to take the old age of his father. He's willing to sacrifice his life for his father. Now, this gives such a wrong message because it reinforces the fact that you as an individual do not have an agency. You are, as an individual um, are not valued, but it is the sacrifices that you make for somebody else that makes you a better person or a better human being. That's why, you know, uh, Devyani is always reviled, like I mentioned, because she refuses to make those sacrifices. That's why uh, all of other, all of Yayati's other sons, apart from Puru, are reviled because they refuse to make this sacrifice. But there's nothing wrong in putting up those boundaries and saying, you know what, you cannot cross this boundary. I cannot give you this. This is too steep a price to pay. And even if the price wasn't too steep, if, if something doesn't sit right with me and if I don't feel like I want to genuinely do something and I feel like you're taking me for a ride, I don't have to say yes. And that is something I think every Indian and every uh, person who comes from a community where this filial loyalty is valued should remember that you don't owe your parents or your older family members anything you don't owe them your life you don't owe them all these sacrifices it's okay to say no it's okay to put yourself first and to say that i value myself and this is what i want so i, I will not do what you say this irony you know you can see in terms of y yayati's story yayati wants this youth because he wants to enjoy uh, the benefits of youth he wants to enjoy women he wants to enjoy chariots and racing and and duels he wants to um, not drool he doesn't want to be wrinkled he doesn't want to be flabby he doesn't want to be weak he wants to be strong and he wants to be like a stud strutting around everywhere and yet when his sons say that you know what this is exactly what we are afraid of that you know because we can't enjoy these same things you enjoyed it all these years but you're not giving us a chance to do the same he gets pissed off so you can see this double standards that are there so not only are we seeing double standards between men and women, we're also seeing double standards in terms of age. So there's a hierarchy as well. And Devayani's story in particular shows us that, uh, that you know, people do have the agency to defy these hierarchical bonds, these patriarchal, mis misogynistic, these really conservative traditional bonds that can tie you down and that can uh, oppress you so much. And I think that is why this story is just so beautiful because it is so rich with wisdom. Uh, as to how we can be in order to become more empowered versions of ourselves and how we can act in order to help others become empowered and to get out of those uh, oppressive situations. You do see at the end of um, Yayati's story that because Puru agrees to um, take on the old age, it is his family who finally gets the throne. But then again, you also see that not all is lost. For example, Yadu, who is uh, Devyani's oldest son, he refuses to uh, give up his youth for his father's old age. And yet the Yadavas are a very prominent community, a prominent uh, group of uh, uh, fighters in the Mahabharata. In fact, Krishna is grows up in a Yadava community right and krishna is again uh, an avatar of vishnu so you see this divine intervention taking place over here we see divinity being born in a group of people who were cursed by yayati and uh, you know whose whose ancestor was cursed by yayati for not taking on his old age so we see that you know sometimes we might think that the consequences of refusing someone who is considered to be more superior to us who is considered to be more respectable um, who is considered to be in a higher position than us you know the consequences of saying no to them the consequences of defying years and centuries of tradition could be catastrophic but sometimes it's not 
like I mentioned, we can see right here that the Yadavas are a very powerful community despite Yayati's curse, despite everything that happens in the Yayati story of Yadu refusing, right? We ultimately see that it doesn't, that, that uh, while certain things do happen the way they happen because of certain choices people make, not everything is catastrophic. So you might be thinking that, you know, by making these choices, by standing up for myself, by building these boundaries, by putting my consent uh, as a priority, making my consent as a priority, I might be making some catastrophic uh, decisions uh, by breaking these conventions. You, you're not, you're actually doing something that's good for you. I personally love Devayani's story and I think uh, her version in the critical edition says so much about the, the few women who we don't know of today, whose names we don't know, but who possibly uh, actually started this feminist fight for us within India, you know, who, who paved the way for uh, women getting freedoms that otherwise we, may, we might not have had or we might have received much, much later. So Devan's story is something that I truly love and I truly cherish and I think her story is something that every person who feels oppressed and who feels like they, they are unable to escape these bonds of tradition, especially religious, religiously sanctioned oppression if they can't escape it. I think we can learn a lot about the art of consent and about building boundaries to protect our own agency and to conserve ourselves and our mental health through Devayani and her son's stories. That's it. This brings me to the end of this video. This has been a really long video, um, but I hope uh, you found some value in it. Um, do let me know what your thoughts are. Uh, do you have any other material related to Devyani that, uh, that I haven't mentioned in this video that you'd like me to check out? I would love to do that as well. And I will see you in the next episode of Reading the Mahabharata, where I bring you more hypothesis and insights as I read through this beautiful, beautiful epic. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day.